It's the radio guy, Mike Prince. Welcome to another episode of the Mike Prince Show. Of course, our job is to bring you news that you can use. Today will definitely not be an exception to the rule. We are happy to have with us on the line all the way from Austin, Texas. We got two for the price of one today. We have Vice President of Houston Tillerson, none other than Mr. Wayne Knox, and Athletic Director, Dr. Monique Carroll. Welcome to the show, each and every one. How you guys doing today? Doing well. Thank you for the warm welcome. Miss Carroll, you doing well, Dr. Carroll, I should say? Yes, doing well. Always good to be on the show. Well, it's always good to have you. Now, um, we got you guys here. And as they say, it's better late than never. We were uh, trying to get you when things first broke out. But I know scheduling is always a critical thing, especially in higher education. All this, you know, all of a sudden people are trying to pull back and say, hey, we want to look out for the vested interests of our student athletes, which is duly noted and going across the gamut. But the truth be said, Houston Tillerson was the first one to say enough is enough. We're going to put the brakes on this thing. What was it that led you guys to making this decision so soon and really starting the trend, being a trendsetter? Somebody has to be first. What what led for you guys to come up with that ultimate decision? Well, Mike, I want to say to you, thank you for the question. Thank you for taking time to talk with us about you know, our decision-making process relative to COVID-19 and the, and the global pandemic that is still persisting. I would say chief among the things that, that made us make the decision as soon as we made it was our student safety. Um, our students, we call ourselves the, the family, so it's family with a ram, our, our mascot in the middle of that, um, because that, that's kind of part and parcel and wholeheartedly who we are as an institution, that we believe that our students are family. So with that, safety was a top priority in thinking through how best to come, come back online for the, for the fall semester. Uh, we, we took everything online, if you will, then we wanted to think about on-ground versus online as a modality to deliver education. We knew that there wasn't, based on all the science that was out there and based on the health officials and the reports and the way things were trending in Central Texas at that time, it was on an upward trend, not as steady, not as steep as it is now, but it was still trending in an, up, in an upward direction. We knew we didn't want to run the risk of putting our students, our student athletes at risk of, of inadvertently um, contracting COVID-19. Because uh, in, in the nature of sports, there's, there's very, it's very, very difficult for one to practice quote unquote social distancing when competing as seriously as, as an athlete compete. So it was the, the trend that we were looking at, um, assessing our overall infrastructure on campus and then the athletic facilities that made us feel it wasn't really safe for us to bring our athletes back on, on I said online but on ground for competition in the in the fall semester. Absolutely, especially if the truth be told. This virus has been hitting people across the globe, but in particular to people of color. And when you have a historically black institution, you have to weigh in all these different options. Now, Dr. Carroll, you in your first year at the athletic director seat, it's kind of a mixed emotion for you, huh? You, you were ready to see what your teams were going to do. And now you got to kind of roll Nelly and slow everything down. How was this for you with your first year out of the gate at HT? My my one thing I can say is that you know it, it, it's always about the health and safety, and even though we have to make those difficult decisions uh, as a university, knowing that we made them with our students in mind, it was challenging. Uh, I would say uh, the letters that I penned to them, uh, letting them know that we were not going to have false sports, uh, was difficult, but. Um, probably more difficult for myself in the essence of, you know, just wanting to get out there, wanting to see them compete, ready to get the ball rolling, because the response and the feedback I got from my student athletes, you know, they were proud to to be around. They were proud that we were taking this seriously. You know, there was disappointment in it, you know, with mixed emotions, seniors, what's next, you know, will there be a spring, will there not? Um, you know, it's COVID-19. We have more questions uh, at times than we have answers. But I think the uh, the response from the student athletes um, and just the, the entire community come together. And, you know, we, we know we're standing up uh, with our chest poked out a little bit. So we know we did the right thing. Absolutely. You did the right thing and you were first. And um, those that keep up with us here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network and the Mike Prince Show know that I love to try to give credit to whom credit is due. And when you take this 
serious nature and you tell the rest of the conference, in this case the Red River Athletic Conference, in the NAIA division, not only in just the NAIA division, but in the college sports as a whole, you got to feel exceptionally proud that you guys really started everything in motion. Some will say, well, it's a bit premature. When you look at the numbers from whence you made your announcement to where they are now, you're looking brighter and brighter as the days go by. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mike. We did take we took some heat from our from our colleagues across the um, the conference and across, and not in a negative way. They would they just your point said it may be a bit premature, but as we as time you know went on, we recognized that this was getting worse and not better. And the point you raised earlier about the disproportionate way in which COVID nineteen has impacted students of color was was also a part of our decision making as well, because we recognized that our students were coming from you know, urban settings and in urban settings and are coming from families. Um, that may have been disproportionately impacted because they are essential workers, that they, we just didn't want to run the risk of them having to, to, to take something back to a family member or loved one that they couldn't give back. And so at the, at the end of the day, this is, is at, the end, at the end of the day, it's really a life or death decision. And so life, death in the sense that if a person w- were to fall ill to um, COVID-19, he or she could pass away. And so that's something that we could not in good conscience um, do to our students and our families because, again, we are we are a family. And as Dr. Carroll mentioned, pending that letter to our student-athletes was, was an incredible um, task because of what we were delivering. It would be even more heartbreaking to, to, to deliver a, a, a letter or to write a note indicating that someone has passed away as a result of us having on-ground sports. So, I mean, it's just the incredible nature of that is just, it's really what drove us to really be very cautious in how we approached it. Um, again, not that other schools were not cautious. We just we just knew what was best for us. And it really had to boil down to what's best for Houston Tillerson. You know, we, we recognize that we are a proud member of Red River Conference, um, but everybody has to make a decision based on their, their household, if you will, and the household of Houston Tillerson. We just knew that things just were not... Um, well positioned for us to, to go into this with a good conference. Well, trust me, they are following the HT train <laughs> with a quickness because right now it's just a matter of time. The only thing that keeps this thing even floating on the Power 5 structure, and I'll say it, is greed. It's uh, all about the bottom line, and the bottom line cannot replace the lives that will and has been lost for the sake of chasing the dollar. So uh, once again, we can't say thank you enough for that. And with all that being said, what is the next move for Houston Tillerson Athletics for 2021? Where do you go from here as far as the students' eligibility, uh, rescheduling games, and even the staffing part of it? How, How do you work all that part out? So, so my one thing I'll say is when you make the decisions early, you give yourself enough leave time to prepare. Uh, and one of the things that uh, was exciting from an athletic standpoint was, you know, now we have time to prepare. We're not making the decision late in August, a week or two weeks before the first contest. And we can really focus on providing them a good experience while they're not on campus. Um, so I think that when you say what's next, I mean, to have the, uh, the best virtual experience possible and engage them uh, in various ways while they're not here physically uh, with us on campus. And then as a conference, uh, we're looking at moving things to the spring. Um, you know, we don't know if that will come to fruition. We'll continue to watch the numbers and monitor what's going on with the pandemic. Uh, but the plan is to try to move this force to spring and give everybody, everyone a chance to compete. And from talking with our student athlete leaders, you know, that that's all they want. They want somebody fighting for them in a, in the safest way possible to give them a chance to compete, um, and and that's what we're going to continue to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, when you talk about merging everything to the spring, I'm thinking about the poor SIDs. Uh, it's going to be rough on them to keep a hold of everything. They have a hard enough time keeping up with the sports that are in season. Will there be some additional help for these guys or they just got to figure this thing out? My one thing I say, well, we're all, we're all going to figure it out. Together. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, uh, if COVID-19 hasn't taught us anything, you know, it has taught us uh, how to figure things out and on the fly and how to get things going. Uh, in a productive manner quickly. So uh, that's something, you know, as a conference, uh, we talked about not just SIDs, but um, 
you know, strength and conditioning coaches, sports medicine professionals, where do they, you know, how would they be able to, uh, you know, load management uh, is what we call it. So how would they be able to do that? And, you know, those are gonna, those things are going to develop over time. But I'm, um, you know, glad that I know we'll commit the resources to doing a first-class operation in the spring. Very good. We're talking right now with Dr. Monique Carroll and Mr. Wayne Knox of Houston Tillerson. They have graciously given themselves some time to me today to discuss some of the behind the scenes action that was going on leading to the Houston Tillerson's decision of postponing their fall sports. Now, of late, there has been a a lot of scuttlebutt about uh, a certain institution that I am fond of that was under the gun for possibly being tagged with a $500,000 cancellation fee. When you had notified some of your fall opponents that you would not be competing in your non-conference competition, did you get any type of backlash like that of, well, if you guys don't play us, there's a cancellation fee we're going to have to charge you with? Uh, no, no. I think uh, we had several great partners in in the aspect of everyone understood what was going on. It was such a fluid thing. Um, granted, we were ahead of the curve a little bit on it, but people have had to come back to us to have those same conversations uh, to make sure we can move forward. And a lot of it is, you know, we'll just postpone the game until next year, or in some cases, okay, we can't play this date, it won't work. But uh, yeah, I think. For the most part, everyone understands what we're in the midst of, and we're only, you know, everybody's talking about wearing the mask. We will only get through it together. Right. I would just add really quickly that I think it, it takes some leadership at the um, at the Red River Conference level as well to so just give an accolade to the to the commissioner. I mean, he he handled this I think very very well. I mean, even recognizing that schools would make different decisions initially, he didn't come from my perspective working with our commissioner. He didn't come with the posture that was punitive. So if you do make this decision, you're going to be in trouble or you're going to have some type of ramification for it. He was working collaboratively with us. Now, collaboratively at the, at the time could have meant you may still need to pay something, but he, he his, the grace in which he approached it, I think, helped us to make our decision and not make us feel as if we were going to be penalized for making a decision that we felt was in the best interest of our, best interest of our institution. And so I think that, that adds to our ability to make this make our, make our decision I think it's helping the other schools and our conference make their decision as well. That our commissioner, he, he had a, he had a, a, a an approach that was as collectively towards uh, resolving this versus trying to um, you know penalize individuals for having to make a decision that was tough for all of us to make. Very good. Very now one thing about this um, because of the structure of the NAIA compared to Division One for the um, NCAA, uh, your budget. Is going to pretty much stay in place. Does it affect your budget one way or the other? Not having the events, to some degree it does. So I mean, athletics is a revenue generator for the institution, and so there there is an impact in that direction. And then there, so there is a, there is an impact um, one way or another. So we're we're monitoring that closely to be sure that we're that we're that we're in a good position as an institution, and also able to respond in in a way that makes um, the spring. Makes sense for the the program, the athletic pro, athletics programs. So we are we're still because it's still early in terms of everything that's going to take place going forward. But we are posturing ourselves for um, an impact left or right. Okay, I like that term, posturing yourself. That's pretty good. I like that. I like that. Now, when you speaking of your generating or money generating sports, I'm assuming that basketball would be your top tier for your money generating sport. Yeah, right yeah. right now, basketball is the one we have uh, tapped as a revenue generator between ticket sales and game guarantees. Uh, they generate, uh, that's our top sport since we're a non-football school. Okay, and which would be the, the, the close second? I would probably venture to say baseball and softball, only because those are additional sports where we do get ticket sales uh, and, and add in volleyball to those. So those would be our, I would, I would call our second tier. Uh, okay. Revenue generation scale. With sports like obviously track and field um, and men and women's soccer where we don't play on site currently uh, being in that last year uh, where there may not be uh, as much ticket sales. Okay, very good. Now, uh, for those who would like to be a season ticket supporter, uh, they might not be able to make the game, but they might want to just support Houston Tillerson Ram Athletics. 
how would one go about and where do your rangers start from? Um, so right now that's something on our on our horizon to uh, look at the feasibility of developing a season ticket program. Um, and so right now I couldn't give you any set prices, but when we have those packages ready, I'll be glad to get back on the show uh, and tell everyone a little bit more about that. Well, we'd be glad to have you back on. So what if a person just wanted to make a donation to Houston Tillerson Athletics? How do they do that? They just simply visit our website, hcu.edu, and click on Donate, and they'll see athletics as an option to make a direct direct contribution towards uh, RAM Athletics. Uh, right, we, just, we bucket it all together right now. And, uh, Dr. Carroll and her leadership is going to work towards um, developing a more comprehensive plan for the, for the organization. Um, but as of right now, anyone can make a donation by visiting our website, htu.edu, and clicking on the Donate button and select RAM Athletics. All right, that sounds very, very good. I want to thank you guys so much for making yourselves available. We have a custom here at the Open Mic and the Mike Prince Show. We allow our guests to have some closing thoughts and comments. And since we have two of you here, I'm going to let you all have some closing thoughts and comment. And the floor is now yours. Mike, once again, thank you for uh, giving us this platform to talk about all the great things going on at HT. Um, I am excited uh, about what, what the future holds for us and everything under Mr. Mr. Knox and President Burnett's leadership. Um, so just con- continue uh, to look for us. Uh, the Rams are coming. The Rams are coming. I like that. The Battle Rams. All right. All right. Wow. I'm going to echo and ditto everything Dr. Carroll said. Mike, thank you for the time to be on the show, and thank you for helping to lift the brand of Houston Tulsa University. And we we love when our partners work with us to help lift our brand. Um, there's a, a proverb that uh, my former volleyball coach um, introduced to myself and President Burnett, and it's that you can go fast alone, but you can go further together. And I think um, the Mike Prince Show is definitely in our tribe of folks helping to move us along. So thank you for giving us this platform to share our story and just invite everyone out there listening to join join the, the family. Uh, we, we definitely appreciate anyone li- looking to celebrate with us and to push us forward and to introduce us to new opportunities. Well, it sounds great. We want to thank you guys for the opportunity of helping to share your story because that's what we're all about here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network because no matter how big, how small, we all have a story to share and it's worth hearing and worth listening from coast to coast, from border to border. And once again, we thank you guys so much. We wish you nothing but continued success in Austin, Texas. Stay away from 6th Street. Because don't do nothing but bring you trouble. (laughs) We want to thank you guys for joining in with us on today. Of course, our social media handles for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are all at the Mike Prince Show. The YouTube channel is Open Mic Broadcast Network. And our website is obnradio.com. And you cannot forget the 24-hour dial-in message line, 713-570-6736. The clock on the wall tells me that is all. I have extended my time for today, and I must exit stage left. But until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.